All right, now you see why we need seven minutes now? Because we've got to talk about cats and dogs. <laughs> thank you, Francis. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you, everyone. Welcome back. Um, I think, I believe, incoming President Sunita Angival wanted uh, Executive Director Nevit to go first. We, okay. will, we will start there. So I'll respond to Governor Dresden's questions and then I'll make my comment if that's okay. Um, just to clarify, um, in terms of the urgency, uh, we, the deadline to provide comment has already passed. Um, I specifically sought uh, permission from the Chief Justice and from Justice Montoya Lewis that we could um, have an extension, which they granted until January 15th. <laughs> um, so uh, we really don't have a lot of time. I do agree that, um, and and certainly um, President Abel and I have been uh, sort of wringing our hands about how we would have this discussion because um, certainly drafting a comment at the board table is not ideal. Um, and uh, President and Hunter did send um, a couple of emails to the board requesting that people send their proposals in advance. Yep. Um, so we did seek to make that happen. Um, but you know, I know everyone's busy. Uh, and so that's why we don't have sort of proposals in the materials. So I was hoping if I could to speak in favor of the motion. Um, and I, I also wrote down my thoughts here um, on the break. I specifically, and I really specifically wanted to respond um, very respectfully to emphasize that I don't think the recommendations do throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, the recommendations keep the bar exam as a pathway, so I want to make sure that's clear, while also developing alternative pathways that will save this, that will serve the same purpose as the bar exam, which is to establish minimum competence to practice law. On June 4th, 2020, the court issued a letter that I think we're all familiar about, which called on lawyers and members of the bar to recognize the harms that are caused when meritorious claims go unaddressed due to systemic inequities or the lack of financial, personal, or systemic support. And the letter went on to say that too often in the legal profession, we feel bound by tradition and the way things have always been. And that we must remember that even the most venerable precedent must be struck down when it is incorrect and harmful. I know we're not talking about a court case, um, but I think it still applies. And I really want to emphasize, especially in my role, that the staff and the volunteers who carry out the work of regulating the profession, they do so with the utmost integrity. They strive and struggle every day in a way that is not visible to most of us to ensure that our systems and processes, including the bar exam, including the character and fitness review, center equity and fairness, as well as public protection. And I am very proud and admiring of the work that they do on behalf of WISBA and our profession. That said, data research and information that the task force studied does show that the bar exam as a tool has weaknesses in terms of equity. And from just a perspective of common sense, I think many of us can acknowledge that there are multiple ways to demonstrate knowledge. And I think we can all imagine, or maybe we even know people who would likely make excellent lawyers, even though they might struggle to pass a bar exam. I have a child who is not neurotypical. Um, and I, I know that they have a lot of knowledge and abilities that may be difficult to demonstrate in particular ways that are easy for other people. Um, bottom line is I think that these recommendations seek to create robust, alternative pathways that center public protection. And I think that they will help us to carry out our regulatory responsibilities. Thank you. All right, thank you, Edi Nevitz. This is the order I currently have people to speak. Incoming President Angival will go next, followed by Governor Tom Heyan, followed by Governor Nam Wen, followed by Governor Serena Sayani, followed by uh, DEI Council Member Raina Wagner. Um, incoming President Sunita Angivel, over to you. You are mute. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I'm going to be mercifully brief. Uh, I just want to say that I was on the board um, in April of 2021. And uh, at that time, I think it was then the Diversity Committee rather than D the DEI Council. The Diversity Committee uh, did write a letter opposing the resolution um, of the board that a bar exam uh, would be necessary um, at all costs. That's just me paraphrasing the resolution. Um, so I just want to point that out for um, folks on the screen. Thank you. All right. Um, Governor Tom Ayan. Okay. Um, I agree with President Abel's grave concern about the declining public trust and confidence in our legal system. And in fact, to me, the public's declining trust and confidence in our government and democracy in general isn't just a problem, it's a crisis. And the legal system is a part of that government that people, in my view, crisis are losing their faith in. I would also agree that Opening the door for incompetent people to be lawyers is going to make that problem worse, not better. But we have significant legal service deserts in our state that prevent the realistic access to justice to communities all across our state, areas all across our state, types of socioeconomic groups all across our state. And I think we have to re reduce the barriers to entry to become a lawyer especially barriers to entry to people that uh, look like the members of the public, not just me, but the members of the public have the, had the same life experiences, members of the public, especially our disadvantaged communities. And that means all members of the public, not just members like me. So I, I understand also the desire to let's have some more study, um, get a better handle on this. But I think that to me, the declining trust and confidence in our legal system as general, the lack of lawyers where they're needed across our state, that's a crisis that just can't wait. That's a crisis that cannot wait. So I support uh, the motion that's pending to uh, rescind this resolute, the past resolution that says you got to have a bar exam. And to save time, when we get to supporting the, uh, the task force recommendation, I'm going to be voting in favor of that for the same reasons I just said. And now I've hogged up too much time, so I'll be quiet and try to figure out how to lower my hand on that thing. <laughs> Governor Tom Ayan, thank you so much. We appreciate you. Governor Nam. Governors, I I am a person who has passed three bar exams. I passed New York, Texas. New York and Massachusetts are the same one, but Texas and Washington State, all within my first five years of practice. And I would say right now, if you sat me and asked me to take a bar exam again, I would fail. And I think that's, I, probably, I don't know if there's a study out there, but if it's the, a study it could be done where we sat down, the, uh, the best practitioner in the state, our Supreme Court justice and judges around the state and asked them to take the bar exam within a week, I don't think most of them would pass. The reason why is most of us, I think most of us here, get into our specialty very, within the first five years of practice. We specialize. And the bar exam is a general practice test. And, and I understand Governor uh, President Abel concern about the public trust, but the, all the other pathway to licensing has experiential learning in it. So, so people would be our lawyers, future lawyers, would get to learn about things that they will ultimately use to practice in order to get licensed. I think that's actually more, I would have more confidence in someone that has experience rather than someone that just passed the bar exam. So I think public confidence can be built that way as well. And that's just my comment. I support the motion. Thank you. Next is Governor Serena Sayani. Over to you. Thanks, Francis. Um, this is a motion that I am struggling with. Um, I think. I'm I'm struggling because I recognize that from um, the historical context of the bar exam that, um, you know, it's something I would want to dismantle just based on that alone. 
Um, but I'm also struggling because as a person who hires and mentors and trains associates um, and graduates from law school, I do feel concerned that without the bar exam, that there is an inequity between um, one, and I said this in a previous Board of Governors meeting, the disparity that will happen when there is options between how a law school graduate is able to become licensed and what firms, larger firms particularly, are going to do in terms of bonusing those that may have already passed the bar versus others. So I worry that it's going to create future pay disparity and discrimination issues. Um, secondly, what I also am concerned about is, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of confidence in the fact that simply because you went to a particular law school that you have greater intelligence than others who went to other law schools. And I find that the bar exam can be an equalizer for all students once they get out of any law school in the country to determine a baseline of understanding, issue spotting, and the like with respect to um, you know, their particular year. I fully recognize that just taking the bar exam does not qualify any law student who's even passed the bar exam to be excellent attorneys or frankly, to be able to hang out a shingle and start private practice. I think mentorship is critically important to a young lawyer's career and successful path. And I also worry about the ability for firms to have the infrastructures in place in order to provide that mentorship. I don't think taking away the bar exam is going to alleviate that concern because I think that exists now. So I say all these points to say I'm struggling with this um, very deeply in the sense that it hits at many core values of mine when it comes to um, racial inequity and um, social justice in this country, let alone our state, providing access to um, competent lawyers, but also understanding that there's a potential practical ramification that may occur as a result of this. Um, and my worry about how that's going to impact employers and their ability to find lawyers and their assessment of law students, one against the other as students are applying for jobs. And I think that unfortunately, and I said this in a prior Board of Governors meeting, um, I wish that part of the task force had included some major law firms and larger law firms in Seattle to discuss this as this is going to create a major problem or without them being stakeholders and how this is going to be rectified. Because while I appreciate that we've consulted with the deans of law schools and the professors in law schools, they are not on the hiring end of these decisions. And so, you know, I don't necessarily think that one's graduate school is indicative of their ability to practice law. So anyway, those are those are all my thoughts. I as, as I said, I'm I'm torn at this point. Um, and I'm I'm really enjoying this discussion and happy to continue it to hear everybody's thoughts. Thank you, City Council. I mean DI Council Member Raina Wagner, over to you. Thank you, President, Acting President <laughs> Adewale. I appreciate um, being invited to share thoughts from the DEI Council with all of you today. And um, I will also be brief because I know that the motion that is up for consideration at this point is the rescinding of the earlier resolution. I echo my co-chair and incoming president, Sanitha Angevel, with wholeheartedly being in favor of the or of rescinding the earlier resolution, but I invite the ta the bar board of governors to creative solutioning. If it turns out that you choose to not rescind that um, that earlier position as you move forward on the next vote, with how how you frame that and um, choose to present your support um, or your position on supporting the bar licensure task force um, report to the to the Supreme Court. Um, I do appreciate also the earlier vote that you took to include the DEI comment um, in the consideration. Um, what we 
took great care as member as co-chairs of the DEI Council and as members of the Council in considering the presentation by the task force members who explained the report. Um, it, the, the, our letter, though very brief, the one that you can find on page 318 of the materials, it reflects the careful consideration of people who are very invested in the bar in volunteering with WISBA. And we also have a great investment and feel a huge responsibility to those that we represent with um, within the legal community, those 40 some thousand members of the bar in the state of Washington. We represent all of them as members of the DEI Council, as do you governors. And we also very specifically represent and speak for the members of minority bar associations. And we felt that very deeply as we listened to the amazing presentations and listen to the work that was done by the leaders of the task force. And when Governor Williams Ruth and Governor Couch came, we questioned them extensively. And um, we took all of that information and review of the report itself here, um, in careful consideration as we drafted that letter. So again, thank you for including that in the comments. Well, and um, But I think it's important for us to also note that we took our personal experiences to crafting that letter as well. As um, Sunitha mentioned, we have people who've been on the committee since the council former committee since the time of the 2021 resolution um, and to, since the time of the emergency action that took place with respect to the bar exam for those graduating from law school during the pandemic. So we brought our experiences to the issue. For me, my personal experience in that space was as a former, as a member and former leader of the Lauren Miller Bar Association, one of the MBAs that we've been discussing. And that experience, um, of course, I worked with our student members during my years in leadership of that organization and got to know quite personally people who are in those boxes that were shared to us earlier about the failure rate of the Washington bar exam and the failure on second try of, um, of candidates for the bar exam. And it doesn't look like a huge number, right? Um, perhaps especially compared to those numbers that you might see out of California that one of our esteemed governors has already mentioned today. But if there are 69 people who are failing on the second try, um, and if you, like I, actually have known some of those people, you will understand that the bar exam itself is a barrier to entry into being um, a member of this bar to providing legal services and filling in some of those legal deserts. And LMBA took that failure personally because we knew our student members were in that small group of people who are failing on the second try and took our, our donations that we got from our supporters. We created um, a bar studies program for folks who couldn't afford the four and five thousand dollar entry fee to be able to take a barbary class in advance and provided them um, bar materials um, at a free of cost for the students and have had a hundred percent success rate with our student members passing after they've taken the LMB, LMBA um, program to support them and if if your structure requires volunteers and donations in order to have people succeed within it. Um, there are pro That's a problem that needs addressing. And we feel at the DEI Council that the recommendations of the Bar Licensure Task Force are working to fill in and solve that problem. Thank you. Thank you, DEI Council Member Raina Wagner. I'm going to give everyone opportunity to be able to speak, but I want to give priorities to governors who are yet to speak, Governor Christina Larry, Governor Mary Rathbone, Governor Kari Petrasic, uh, Petrasic, if you need to speak, please indicate I would push you ahead of the line. Um, but let me know if you need to speak. Now we're going to go, the, the current order I have is Governor Kevin Fay, Governor Jordan Couch, and Governor Todd Bloom. Governor Kevin Fay, over to you. Uh, thank you, Treasurer and Acting President uh, Adwale. Um, I'm going to do this in, in three parts. The first part is to uh, do uh, Me Too uh, for Governor Sayani's uh, um, observation that 
the bar exam is a very leveling thing between people who go to different law schools. Um, I have the opportunity, uh, I have my JD from the University of Buffalo, which is a mid-tier three school. And I have an LLM from Harvard Law School. I got to tell you, the faculty at Harvard was not appreciably better. The best students at Harvard were not appreciably better than the best students at Buffalo. The worst students at Harvard were capable of reading and writing. The worst students at University of Buffalo were functionally illiterate. And I'm not talking limited to people of color. I mean, I have friends who are just not capable of writing a coherent sentence and they got through law school somehow and they were not able to pass the bar exam. And that's probably a good thing given who they were. Now, moving along, the bar passage rate was higher at UB than Harvard because Harvard gives you lots of courses that have nothing to do um, with uh, practice of law. In fact, when we started as first year associates, uh, the people who knew what they were doing were from St. John's, which had you know, a 90% bar passage rate in New York. Um, they were very practice oriented. And unlike the folks from Harvard, they knew how to perfect a security interest by filing a UCC3 that could actually do their job. Um, the second point I wanna make on the alternative pathway um, is that you know, if you look around the world, people become law lawyers in a lot of different ways. Uh, in most of Europe, Australia, law degree is an undergraduate degree. And then in order to become a practicing attorney, you have to article for a year or two, get practical experience, um, or in most continental Europe, you have to get a, a master of laws in LLM in order to be able to practice, um, in order to sit for the equivalent of the bar exam. Articling seems like a good idea until you understand that article clerks are treated like slave labor. They are exploited terribly. And being, be getting that article, getting that article position, articling position, is a far higher barrier than passing a two-day bar exam. Where you article is extremely important. And gosh, the good old, I also, you know, the good old boy network is hard and fast on who gets to article where. You know, and they're basically underpaid paralegals. They're paid like minimum. Well, paid Mr. Paid. Chair, we are not talking about articling. We are talking about a bar exam and keeping a resolution for it or not. We really need to stay on target given the time that we focus on the motion at hand. Thank you, Governor Williams Root. Uh, Governor Kevin V. Um, yes, our, you are talking about getting practical experience from who, from where. Please continue. Yeah, it's articling. Sorry, Brent, but I've seen these people get exploited with my eyes, and I am worried about that. Point of order, Mr. Chair, this is not where we are in the discussion. The discussion is on the resolution. Articling is something about the substance, which we're going to get to if this resolution is rescinded. Can Governor, we please keep our comments on the motion? All right. Governor yeah. Williams Roots, your exam, comment is noted. As currently, yeah. Go as ahead. The bar exam is currently constituted, requires people to know or become aware of a vast variety of, of uh, the law that can affect their clients. Now, does this hurt people in legal deserts? No, it does not. Um, one of the things we've learned about legal deserts is that the intersectionality of legal problems of people in these legal deserts is a whole panoply of the law and the silos of our laws preventing adequate representation. You can have a, a farm worker in Yakima get arrested, then they lose their job, so they get evicted. Oh, um, that's a civil matter. Oh, it, because they are undocumented, their immigration status prevents them from accessing programs that would address homelessness. So uh, golly, there might be a reason why you would want to have young lawyers know a full panoply of what the law requires. And I agree with Nam, if I had to take the, the, law, the, the bar exam today, I would fail. But when I am dealing with a client and they're getting a divorce, golly, 35 years ago, I still remember 
that Washington is a community property state. All right. Th thank you, Governor. The bar exam requires a breadth of knowledge that I think is is necessary. Okay. Thank you, Governor Kevin Fay. Um, next in line is Governor Todd Bloom. Let's, like uh, Governor Williams Root said, let's keep to the topic. The motion before us is whether we should rescind, uh, is to rescind the earlier decision made by this board that stipulates that only the only pathway through the practice of law in the state of Washington is through passing a bar exam. All right, Governor Todd Bloom, over to you. <clears throat> Yeah, I'll I'll uh, reserve comment for uh, for for uh, later in the in the okay. meeting. Okay, thank thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, Governor Jordan Couch. In in the interest of keeping my comments focused on just this particular aspect of it of the bar exam, I want to respond to a couple of things that have been raised on this issue. Which, uh, starting with President Abel, mentioned that the, he felt the bar exam was the most likely way to increase trust. The data does not bear that out. The feedback we've gotten from the public does not bear that out. I think it's an interesting concept, but it's not supported by the things we need to, by, by the information we're getting right now. The information we're getting is that the public is concerned about a lack of practical skills among lawyers. That is not supported by a bar exam. The information we're getting is that the bar exam does not do anything. And if it is creating a sense of security in the public, that's actually unhelpful because it's preventing us from doing things that actually protect the public. Uh, President Abel mentioned that the public is, you know, he said better served by a bar exam because there is one study that indicates that over the course of more than 20 years in practice, those who had just straight diploma privilege um, had a 1% higher rate of bar discipline. 1% is not good. It is not effective. It is not a valuable test. The question we should be asking is not, are people better protected by a bar exam, but are people best protected by a bar exam? And there the data is no. Another study that came out at that uh, that also looked at this in a more detail looked at lawyer effectiveness and found that the bar exam has zero correlation to predicting who will be a, an effective lawyer. It is not protecting the public better and definitely not protecting the public best. Um, as far as and and I think so, I think that's really important. I also want to kind of address this as we talk about the bar exam. I've heard a comment a couple times that I think is really important as far as myths go to dispel. Um, and that is, I've heard a few people refer to, you know, the bar exam. We know the history of the bar exam, but that is the history of the South 100 years ago. That is not true. And that is a misunderstanding of the history in an important way. I want to read a quote, and I will warn at first that this quote is incredibly offensive. But I think it's important because it came from a northern man who was in charge of hundreds and hundreds of bar exams. He said, quote, I am not nor ever have been in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the white and black races, that I am not nor ever have been in favor of making voters or jurors of Negroes, nor of qualifying them to hold office, nor to intermingling with white people. And I will say in addition to this, that there is a physical difference between the white and black races, which will ever forbid the two races living together on terms of social and political equality. And in as much as they cannot so live while they do remain together, there must be the position of superior. I am as much as any other man in favor of having the superior position assigned to the white race. Some of you may have already recognized that came from Abraham Lincoln, a northern man in charge of bar exams, a northern lawyer who set up parts of the system that we have today. Oregon, as a state, was founded as a white haven, our neighbor just nearby us. I speak to you today from the Central District, an area in Washington that was set up, as we all learned the history together in one of our meetings, to create a cheap source of housing his labor when Black people were not allowed in actual proper, sad, proper Seattle from one of the developers of this city. And this district still sees the repercussions of those decisions, of that redlining, of the recent history of that. Oregon still sees the repercussions of its founding. Racism is not a Southern history. It is an American present. And the bar exam is no exception to that. We can say that the bar exam had this history, but the data shows that the bar exam is currently having a disparate racial impact. And more remarkably, even though the National Conference of Bar Examiners started 25, more than 25 years ago now, doing work to try to solve the racial disparity in the bar exam, the impact of all of their changes over the last 25 years has been zero. 
they have done nothing to solve the racial disparity in the bar exam because the system itself was rotten from the start and nothing has been done to solve these historic inequities. The bar exam is not a history of racism. It is a present of racism being expounded upon our members and serving no valuable purpose. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Couch. At the beginning of this debate, I had interrupted um, Nancy Hawkins uh, to remind her that I will give her an opportunity to be able to make comments when we get to this side of the debate. Nancy, I want to give you the opportunity if you still want to comment. You know, um, thank you, Francis. I guess I would just say my thoughts are very um, mixed. This is so complex. Um, I totally agree with Jordan with regard to the history issues. Uh, but I also look back at my own life. Um, I'm one of those people who 43 years ago now um, failed the bar exam when I took it, failed by only, if my, if my memory is correct, by a couple points, um, five points or something like that. Uh, it was awful, humiliating, costly. Um, and I had to wait six months and take it again and passed it. But the fact that I failed the first time had no effect whatsoever on what kind of lawyer uh, I was, uh, am. And I am always, and, and so it's still one of those things that you don't even really think about. But I've talked to many, many people who had the same experience. And back when I went to school, uh, UPS was known as the school that taught people how to be lawyers. And the UW was the school that taught you how to pass the bar. And that's why the UW had a higher pass rate. That was the, the myth. So um, the fact that I didn't pass the first time has had no effect on what kind of lawyer I am, um, good or bad. Um, but it was pain in the ass for to not have be able to work for six months while I got better at it. And the reason, of course, just as um, as Tara said, it was because there were other things going on. I, I don't have a learning disability, but I had to work. And so I didn't study as much as the other people I knew. And I paid the price for that. Um, so I'm interested in other paths. I'm interested in other paths that will result in better lawyers because I think the existing system doesn't produce the best lawyers. Um, because I look around at some of the people I have had cases against and I always think, you know, basically, oh my God, Doug, how can you let this person still practice law? Um, because they just seem so incompetent and uh, unethical and, and all. Thank so, um, but I want those other paths to mean something. I'm, I'm still confused by the idea of lowering the pass rate, you know, the number of points or eliminating um, consideration of uh, misdemeanors um, because I think it opens up the Bar Association to an accusation of dumbing it down to let in people of color. And we all know that that is not a helpful um, impression for people to have. So that that is confusing to me. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to call on Chair and um, former Governor uh, Chair Michael Cherry because he posted some things in chat that is very relevant to this to to this discussion. So I want him to be able to, if he's still here, and some of the uh, information that he's providing in chat uh, might be relevant to answering some of the questions that Governor Serena Sayani asked on chat. Uh, um, Chair Cherry, are you still there? Can you speak up?
I think we'll if if you are mute if you are speaking. He says in the chat he's still having tech problems. Oh, he's still having okay. Um uh, Edi Nevit, could you let me read uh what she, what he's posted? My screen is all over the place. Yes. From the data guide, just want to point out that we are rapidly approaching five years since diploma privilege was used to address the pandemic and a survey of the impact on the choice, on this choice, on the people who receive the privilege, discipline issues and any harm to the public would be useful. And we should not miss the opportunity to collect and evaluate this data in an anonymized manner. All right, thank you. Um, now we're going to go to GC uh, Shankland, over to you. Yeah, just briefly. So I'm hoping that the board will discuss the effect on the process. Um, and I, by process, I mean the task force's work, which as I understand it is actually still in a pretty early stage and there's a lot more work to do. So, and I haven't heard that conversation, I don't think. So if the board decides to continue, you know, not change the resolution, will that deprive the task force of the board's input on um, the experiential pathways and the bar exam alternatives? Because nobody's saying get rid of the bar exam, right? They're just saying develop alternatives. But if you have this resolution and you keep it, does that mean or will the effect of that be that the, the board can't weigh in on that, right? You've, are, you've already decided it. And um, so I guess uh, there might be a concern because maybe maybe it's important that your voice, voice be part of the conversation. So I just want you to think pretty carefully about what is the effect of the resolution on your ability to have a voice in this process. And then, you know, are you by continuing this resolution suppressing other input and conversation because you are continuing to keep the resolution? And again, I'm not trying to have an opinion. I just think it's important for you to have some conversation and thought about the effect of it. And then third, the board passed this resolution in 2021 before the information that the task force currently has was developed. And there are a lot of questions in the chat. So is there something about, you know, does the board need more information to decide, you know, the impact or effect of continuing or modifying the resolution? So I'm just hoping that you could at least think about that. It seems important. Thank you. I'm I'm trying to uh, round up this discussion so that we can go to vote. But James, my first thing, someone we all respect and honor, uh, made some comment in chat, and I want to give him an opportunity to be able to say one or two things to what he said in the in, in chat. James, James, are you there? Uh, yeah, I I am. I'll let him get closer to my mic. Can you hear me? I yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. I have my headphones on. I, I just wanted to say, don't let this resolution keep you from getting to the meat of the pro issue here. Just change it. Don't rescind it. Just change a couple words in paragraph one and say, hey, we'll, we'll have a bar exam. Then let's talk about whether there's other ways. We already have other ways besides a bar exam. <clears throat> well, no, I guess we don't. But, but uh that's what I suggest. We've been bogged down for an hour now about the resolution, but a lot of people have been giving their comments otherwise, and and I think it's been valuable. But I, I think you should do your best to move along. So, all right. Thanks for reading my thank, chat. Thank you, as usual. We appreciate your support of the board. All right, um, Edi Nevit, can you restate the motion? Yes. If I can get back to my right notes, okay. The motion is, and I reworded it a little bit for what I thought would be clarity. So if the mover and seconder can let me know if they disagree, but it says move to rescind the board's resolution in support of a bar exam to ensure a competent ethical and diverse legal profession adopted on April 17th, 2021. Um, and the mover of the motion is? I agree with that. 
Okay. Uh, the second, uh, who second the motion? Idinevic, you have a note on who second the motion? I'm going to look to, I believe it was me, Francis. Oh, yeah. <laughs> It Thank was Mary. You. All right. Um, we will proceed to vote. In the absence, let me check second page just to be sure. Let's proceed to vote, Edie Nevitt. Okay. Tom Ahern. That's, I saw a thumbs you up. You have to speak up, Tom. <laughs> I was trying to get my little thing to unmute myself. Yes. Okay. Sunita Angelo. Aye. Todd Bloom. Negative. Jordan Couch. Aye. Matthew Dresden. Hmm. Really torn. I like uh, James McPherson's edit there. Uh, well, I taking. Uh, okay, I. Kevin Fay. Would it be possible to make a friendly amendment? I think at this point we probably need to finish the vote and then we could have additional amendment or additional motions. That's okay, correct. That case, I think no. this this motion is already in motion. Okay. In that case, no. Christina Larry. I would also vote no. Nam Win. Aye. Kari Petrosik. Aye. Mary Rathbone. Aye. Surya Sayani. No. Brent Williams Ruth. Aye. Allison Whitney. No. Um. The, so we received we... eight affirmative votes and five negative votes. I believe that we that need two thirds. Uh, sorry. No, we... we needed either two thirds of those voting, which I believe would have been nine, or a majority of the board, which is eight. So I think it passes. Julie, okay. you want to confirm? All right. The, the Julie, do you confirm that? Yes. All right. Thank you. Now the next issue is: Do we go? Uh, do we make a comment? On? Do we? Yes. Jordan, uh, Governor Jordan Couch. Uh, I would move, as I did before, that we uh, send a comment supporting this, uh, but including uh, past President Clark's recommendation that the Bar Licensure Task Force created a plan that, input, uh, uh, that their final plan has equity for those who have already gone through this process. Um, could you restate that motion again? I yeah, sorry that the Board of Governors supports this proposal and recommends that the Bar Licensure Task Force uh, maintain equity among those who have already completed these programs or these requirements. Okay, so you want us to send this to the Bar Licensure Task Force and not to the Supreme Court? Oh, sorry, to the Supreme Court, yes. Okay, all right, any second? Second. All right. Um, incoming President Sunita Angeville, second. Any discussion? Right. We have had a lot of discussion today. <laughs> okay, Governor Couch. I just want to say a couple of brief things that I hope will uh, dispel some myths on this on this section of it and answer some questions. Uh, first off, Governor Sayani had asked in the chat. Um, Let's see. Do we have statistics that show that these states that have diploma privilege have greater diversity representation? What we do have is statistics showing that reducing the cut score uh, amazingly has uh, no impact on increasing malpractice, increasing uh, bar discipline, and actually complaints against lawyers go down as the cut score for the bar exam goes down. I think that's really valuable information. We don't have a lot of data on the switch from diploma privilege to a bar exam, mainly because most states only instituted for the bar exam because people of color were allowed to start practicing law because they were starting to graduate law school. And that's why bar exam as a mandatory effort was put into place. 
I also want to note that what we're talking about is not diploma privilege. What we're not talking about is not allowing anyone who completes these requirements to just automatically pass, you know, start practicing law. There is still review in place. Anyone who wants to be licensed under these proposals has to submit a portfolio demonstrating their practical skills to the Bar Association for review. What we're really talking about is taking away the authority that we've been abdicating to the NCBE over licensure and taking back control of that. While in addition to that, mandating and ensuring that not only do people demonstrate the ability to pass a test once, but that they demonstrate practical skills necessary to practice law. Uh, Governor Sandy also asked the question about large law firms being involved in this. I think Brent Williams Ruth mentioned this in the comments, but it's worth saying we did have people from Perkins Coie, Davis Wright Tremaine on this task force who committed, and we also reached out to larger law firms soliciting feedback on this and got largely supportive feedback. And actually they were supportive of this proposal when we did so. Um, and the last thing I'll note on this um, is that really what we're talking about here, and I understand people have mentioned that there are, you know, we don't know that the bar exam is good. We don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. I completely agree with this. The first recommendation of this proposal is that we adopt the next gen bar exam right away. The last recommendation of this proposal is that we do what Governor Cherry has talked or past Governor Cherry has talked about, and we really start focusing on collecting data to see what works. This is not the final solution. This is a step towards better. That's what we're focusing on here right now is a step towards better so we can hopefully have the best situation. Because the reality is the bar exam of the past has failed us. We know that from the data. Can we do better? Let's try things while keeping a bar exam as a baseline so we can study that effect. And also look at the profession over the future. I think it was uh, Governor Nam who mentioned that, uh, our Governor Nguyen who mentioned that, you know, none of us could pass the bar exam today if we took it. Yet all of us think of ourselves as competent lawyers. All the lawyers who get disciplined pass the bar exam. So how do we ensure competency over time? And what we're trying to do here is create alternatives so we can assess what is the best way to ensure lawyer licensure while mandating in every one of these proposals that the Bar Association and the Supreme Court still has authority over deciding who becomes a practicing lawyer. They still have review. They still have say over this. No one graduates law school and is allowed to practice law right away. They have to be approved by the state bar still. So okay. thank you. Thank you. I, I want to encourage all commenters. We have been at this for more, th more than an hour. I want to encourage commenters to, uh, to uh, keep their comment within the motion that we have before us. Um, so this is the order. Governor Sayani, Governor Dresden, Governor Bloom, and Governor Nam. Okay, Governor Sayani, over to you. Um I just want to say this on the record that I'm adamantly opposed to lowering the score um, for passage rate for the bar exam, given that the genesis of this conversation is to create more diversity within the bar, somehow giving an implication that people of color are not as intelligent or don't have the ability to pass. I understand that this may be as a result of um, needing to um, the, the accommodations that need to be made because of the ability to study for the exam or create, have Barbary access to Barbary courses or whatever. But on its face, I find this quite honestly to be slightly offensive to the fact that there is not assumed a level of competency between all people who take this exam. So maybe I'm interpreting that wrong, but you know, I'm adamantly against that from the way this is hitting me at my core. Thank you, Governor Sayani. Governor Dresden? Um, thanks. Uh, so I, I agree with Governor Sayani. I don't support that. I was actually, um, that wasn't what I was going to say, but but she reminded me. Um, and I was actually reminded that I was kind of surprised, actually very surprised when Dean Verona said that the the thing that they thought they might change that 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 they put that it wasn't low enough, that they should go move to 260 and that 266 was not low enough. Um, that that took me aback, uh, and I don't. Uh, so, and I don't support uh, lowering the rate. But, but I also, I want to say that while, I, and like so much, so much thanks and credit to Jordan and Brent for for all their work on this. Um, I agree with a lot of the things in the in the proposals, but I don't agree with everything. And there's some things that I really do not agree with. And so, I, if for Jordan's motion, as stated, I'll be voting no because I do not support all of those things. Now, I mean, I don't know if we're going to get to the point where we're going to like, you know, 
adjusted and say, well, we support this and we just support that. But I just want to explain that I, I support a lot of the things, um, but not everything. And and I don't feel that I could vote, vote yes on the motion as stated. I know we're not there yet, but I just want to put that out there. Thank you. All right. I'm going to be moving it in good order. Governor Bloom. Yes, thank you, uh, Acting President uh, Arwali, and, and uh, I'd like to thank uh, Jordan and, and Brent again for their uh, uh, work and, and comments. Particularly, I think they're they're well received and, and helpful. Uh, a couple of uh, I had like about three or four different things here. I want to kind of run through. Several of them are quite related. Uh, you know, I I think about the economics of law practice, about the economics of a professional services business. And and where the, the the bar exam and where the the competency um, really kind of pushes people. One of these things about the uh, the, the next gen bar exam that I found re rather distressing was the fact that they said, well, you know, people can't work under pressure, so therefore we we relieve the pressure by not having time limitations or relaxing time limitations. That is part of what makes uh, successful lawyers successful. They have internalized. They have they have. Uh, uh, memorized they have they, they've, they've used their skills in order to have quick responses to be able to, to you know thinking fast on your feet is one of the hallmarks of a really uh, skillful lawyer and if and yeah if you want to take six hours to do what it would take one hour for somebody else to do that's going to have a huge impact on your law practice so it's not that somebody can't do this you know every uh, literate American can read English or every literate person uh, worldwide can read you know, in their in their language and can learn and understand the law is nothing but written words and his in, in his language and rules that are that are con concocted. So, you know, I, I had a, a in fact, when I was still in law school, I had a, a colleague who said any idiot can become a lawyer. And I don't think that and I've never that's never been disproven to me. And, you know, as I believe Governor Couch and some others have referenced that the, that the people who pass the bar are being dis, disbarred because they're they're unethical or for whatever reason right so uh that's that's clearly you, you know i think that there's you know some comfort i don't think there's absolute confidence that somebody passes a bar it, it's okay to pack it's okay to practice but you know we do the best we can you know we put up the guardrails to perfect to protect the, the profession when i was grading the charter financial analyst exam and i've graded it for several years one of the things that the graders would say to each other is protect the charter make it worth something make it mean something and, you know, if if something is, is valuable, you know, it, it's it's worthy of applying yourself and, and working and, and protecting yourself from being, uh, you know, uh, from violating things that you know to be criminal. I mean, people, is this, is this something about more? And, and I think that some of the things that we're facing reflect more on society and other institutions than they do to the bar. Educational attainment. You know, is is uh, you know if it's valued in the home, if you've you know sociology research. I'm not making this up. I'm not trying to be controversial, but sociology sociological research indicates that two parent households, children from two parent households, do better uh, socioeconomically over the course of their life. They're, that's not a groundbreaking news, and I'm not and I'm not trying to be controversial by making that statement. But there are different factors that affect people. In, in developing their mor morality and their educational skills and their goals and things. And, and people can change over life. Okay. You know, uh, I think about Ben Carson and he did great, quite well. So, but, but going on for economics, if, if somebody's not able to, to, to practice, you know, they're not going to earn as much in, in life. It's not going to be. And, and so we look, I, I just cited a, a research study yesterday from Georgetown uh, law school and, and uh, the Thompson Reuters published on the 2023 uh, in 2022, showing that demand is down, in inefficiency is up, productivity is down across the board. You know, this, I, I would challenge this, this law, de legal deserts, you know, economics says that if there's, if there's a demand, then it will be supplied at, at that, at that price. So if, and I get that law school debt, that student debt, which I had, you know, six figures plus, you know, of, of debt, is is a clear clear impediment to people, but that's the part of the, the the price of admission in my in my view. If you really have that desire and the and the skills, then you should be able to be uh, uh, ad admitted, and you should be able to build towards that and and, and overcome those things that you right. those personal uh, attributes. Now, the other thing, uh, clearly, uh, the feedback. I think the feedback when we have fifty something people out of a forty thousand, you know, it's those who have 
you know, the, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, I, you know, yeah, but how does that affect the, the other, the other 41,990? And then uh, lastly, are we setting up a, a situation where we're going to have second class citizens? Serena, uh, uh, Governor Sayani made some very cogent points with regards to big, big firm uh, 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 feedback on this, essentially, which is that, you know, they're only hiring uh, uh, order the quaff and law and law review. Right. Or, or who are and maybe not her firm, but, you know, a lot of, you know, Davis Wright, Tremaine and Kano Gates. So if you're not a top 10 percent of your class or a top, you know, whatever, if you don't get that, you're not in that firm. So you don't get that that, that top dollar uh, thing. And so we could be setting up a second class citizen type of thing. Here. And, I, and I fear that's kind of what we've already done with the APR six program is that they don't have those class rank. They don't have those kind of academic things that, that distinguish themselves. So I, I, I have grave concerns about these alternative pathways. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. And the other, uh, the one last point quickly is that experts, we've, we've, in, we defer to experts, I, I believe, um, inordinately, because, I mean, clearly we look at, at, you know, one of the most famous experts over the last several years, Dr. Anthony Fauci, you're not going to get sick from uh, COVID if you take the vaccine. False. You know, masks work. False. Six feet is, is, is a, Let's is a circle the, false. So, I, so I'm just saying experts, you know, we can defer please. But yet to, to, to our detriment. And thank you. Thank, thank you, Governor Bloom. Let's let's keep. Please sure. do not let us repeat what other governors had already uh, point they have already made. Let's keep to the motion that we are discussing. Okay, Governor Nam, and then Governor Christina Larry, and Governor here and after that. Governor, oh, I, I will be voting yes for this motion. And but I just want to take a moment to acknowledge the people I think will not be voting yes and. First, I'd like to acknowledge Governor, uh, Governor, um, President Hunter and Bell concern. The bar exam is for, and licensing is for the public, for the public to know that once you get a license, that they have somebody with a minimum competence to practice law and they can somewhat trust in handling their legal situation. That's why I think the three alternative passage to alternative to getting the bar exam I think those are those are adequate and a step toward relieving the public concern about competency of lawyers. I think those are good steps. In fact, I think in some ways, knowing that the person you're talking to has some experience in practical practice is better than knowing that they pass a general law exam, bar exam. The second part is I, I like to acknowledge Governor Faye's comment about uh, the alternative pathway is not always fair. And we, and that's an acknowledgement that the recommendation here are not, is we're not creating a perfect system. That's not possible because the, the path to licensing is all about access. If you take the bar exam, most people, most people pay $4,000 to $5,000 to take practice exam, to take class where you sit in front of a video. A lot of people can't afford that. At the same time, recognizing what Dr. F what Governor Fay said, apprenticeship program is also will also have an access problem because there will be certain people that will not have access to those apprenticeship programs. But that's something that we can work on that we can improve. All right. And finally, Thanks. I also think that this is not a perfect thing we're creating. And this is a step in process. This is a step. I don't, I also share my concern with Governor Preston and Governor Sayani about lowering the score test. But I think this is a step towards something that I think is an improvement over what we have now. And that's why we voted this thing. All right. Thank you. Uh, Governor Christina Larry, I want everyone to remember to, re I want to remind everyone that we're 23 minutes above time. Uh, Governor Christina Larry. Uh, thank you. So I just had some quick comments. Well, mostly real question because I felt like I knew where this was going, but then the more people talk, the more I got confused. So if Jordan or Brent could explain what happens with the task force after this, whether it gets passed, whether it's not, there's still going to be more from the task force from what I'm understanding. But it sounds like every time I said someone talks, I get confused that maybe there isn't. So that is the one question I had. And then I am in favor of there being alternate pathways. I do have some concerns with things as written. I agree with Nancy on the financial issues. I agree with Governor Sayani about the bar passage rate. I also, as someone who works in a law school in the experiential department who raises concerns, 
I worry about the law schools policing themselves because I think they do sweep things under the rug because they want to continue to look good. So I do have some issues, but in general, I am in favor of this. But yeah, my main question is with the task force, what actually is going to be happening next? Thank you. All right, uh, Governor Han. Well, so I speak before we get the answer or just tell me what to do? I, your comment, I have you listed as speaking okay. now. Okay, all right, four quick points because I already said my piece earlier. Uh, one, if we're serious about access to justice, I think we need more lawyers, not someday in the future after more study, but now. Two, uh, the task force, I think task force recommendation is not perfect. Three, but on balance, it, I think it's at least a step forward, and therefore I'm going to be voting yes to send it on to the Supreme Court. All right. Thank you. Uh, E.D. Nevich. Two very quick points. Um, one is, you know, as we sit here in this debate, I really, I wish that the board had access to all the information that the task force had. And, and I often, and I mentioned that because I just think it's often the case that, um, you know, the folks making recommendation, they have had access to a lot more information. They spent a lot more, and they've discussed many of the same points that are being raised here. And I would just, so I just want to point that out. Um, and one one more thing I wanted to say is um, I want to remind folks that there are many different ways to practice law. I hear a lot about, you know, high pressure and being able to do things in a time sensitive way and that the bar exam really demonstrates that. But there's so many different ways to be a lawyer and they don't all look that way. Um, those are my two points. All right. Thank you. Um, let me check second page. In the absence of any other hands raised, we're going to go into vote, uh, uh, into voting on this motion. Um, it, okay, I just saw a hand. Governor Couch. Quick. I just wanted to, I just wanted to make sure I respectfully answered uh, Governor Governor Larry's question on this uh, as to what happens next. Uh, what happens next is this goes to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is then going to tell the Washington Bar Licensure Task Force what they want us to do next, whether it's to reject all of this, stop, whether it's to continue working on some of these, not work on others of these, implement. Like it's it's going to the Supreme Court right now for them to tell the Bar Licensure Task Force what to do next. All right. Thank you. Governor Dresden. Yeah. Sorry. Just quick fault for Jordan. I, it's, I thought we what we're doing here is saying whether we are providing a comment like whether we support this, not to whether you can submit this to the Supreme Court. Do my mind my, my misunderstanding? Sorry, I I miss I wasn't clear enough there. Uh, this is submitted to the Supreme Court. The Bar Licensure Task Force is completely separate. Frankly, I, I you know if I'm just being honest with you guys, I don't think they care at all what the Board of Governors says or does. <laughs> but the Supreme Court is going to be tell the next step, regardless of what happens here today, is the Supreme Court is going to be reviewing comments with the Bar Licensure Task Force and then making a recommendation to the Bar Licensure Task Force of what to do next. Regardless of what happens here today, that's what's happening next. If we approve this, our our if we our support of it and comment, which I really do think Governor Clark's comment is helpful enough, I'm probably going to share with the Bar Licensure Task Force, regardless of what happens here today, um, that will all go forward to the Supreme Court as part of the feedback on this proposal. All right, uh, because the two of you have been very involved and we are grateful to the two of you for this. I'm going to give Governor Williams Root the last word before we vote. Governor Williams Root, if you're there, can you unmute and speak and then we can vote. Um, I have nothing to add. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate you. All right, let's go, uh, Edi Nevitz. Let's do the roll call vote. Okay, and I'm going to restate it again. I, I took a few liberties again. So Jordan, uh, Sunitha, if you can make sure that you agree with it. Um, this is the motion is that the board issue a statement to the Supreme Court in support of the task force's draft recommendations and recommends that the bar licensure task force ensure the recommendations are carried out in a way that is equitable to those that have already completed the requirements of the APR6 law clerk program. Agreed. Thank you. So, Tom Ahern. Yes. Sunita Angelville. Yes. Todd Bloom. Negative. Jordan Couch. Aye. Matthew Dresden. No. Kevin Fay. No. Christina Larry. 
Yes. Nam Wen. Yes. Kari Petrasic. Kari. Said yes. Thank you. Yes. Yep, yes. got it. Mary Rathbone. Yes. Serena Sayani. No. Brent Williams Ruth. Williams Ruth. Aye. Allison Whitney. No. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight to five motion passes. All right. Thank you, everyone. And this is one of the most important debates we have had on this uh, on this platform. Thank you to our members that participated um, online, and we are grateful to all of you. And I hand over the gavel back to President Abel. All right. Thank you very much, Francis. First of all, Francis, I want to thank you for presiding over that debate. That was a wild and bully one. It was uh, very well, very well done uh, from the chair, and I appreciate you taking that on. Um, one quick comment I will make is that um, from my perspective, this is exactly the type of debate that can and will build trust in this organization and profession. Over the last couple of hours, um, the comments have been respectful, uh, informed, and robust. And I think we've given um, some uh, uh, good discussion and comments on to the court. And I think the members and the public who are viewing can take um, great pleasure and confidence in what we are doing.